I just, I love the Lord so much. I love what he's doing in us. I love what, I, I know there are so many uh, different challenges and different things that we're facing at different levels. And I know there's uh, things that you guys are dealing with on that we may not even know about, but I know who does know. And I know that uh, a part of our responsibility as believers, like the, the mandate that we have from God isn't just to receive his goodness, but is to display his goodness. Like there are so many people around us that, that don't know the hope, that don't know that he is the light that darkness cannot put out. And, and it, like darkness is still trying to figure out what happened to the light of Jesus and, and who he is and what he is. And, and so I just today, I, as we get into the word today and, and uh, I have a message, I have something the Lord's given me to tell you, but, I, but on top of that, I, I want you to think through not just receiving the name of Jesus and who he is to you, but how are you a carrier of that everywhere you go? And that requires that we step out of our comfort zone. It, requ it requires that we assert ourselves in prayer, that we assert ourselves in relationship with others. There are people around us that need to hear the hope of Christmas and who he is. And maybe greater at a, at a great, no other time has been this significant for them than this. And so I just, I believe the Lord's just going to begin to show you. I know you're already doing it, but, but let's just take it to the next level over the next few months and, and, uh, and or a few weeks as the end of the year and then into the next year of just looking for opportunities to speak life. You don't know what devils people are facing, but you have the hope. As believers, we have this living hope inside of us, and one word can change the direction of somebody's life. One prayer can change the direction. One dollar given to, to a cause, a kingdom cause. God can take what just seems like a moment, and he can change it. He can use it to transform eternity. So I just want you to understand the bigness of, of who you are. And, and sometimes situations that we are in personally, whether it's for our family or, or whether it's on a, on a, a global uh, um, you know, level or whatever it is, it can cause us to look, uh, to get tunnel vision and to only see our circumstances and to only see and to think that our influence is small and to think that our, our voice is not heard and to think that, that our God can't do the impossible. Like the devil's still playing that trick. Like even in light of Christmas and the resurrection of, of, of Jesus, he still tricks us into thinking that God can't, that God's not able. But I'm here, and I know you're with me today to declare he is able. He is the God that can do the impossible. And Christmas reminds us that God always keeps his word and that he always has a plan. And unto us, Isaiah declares, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And we've been, we've been looking at this this month, and we're kind of leading all the way up in, uh, to Christmas Eve, these, these uh, ancient prophecies of Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet 730 years before Jesus, before Jesus was born, before we, that baby took his first breath. And, and he declares the coming of the king, but he declares it in a time of, of great darkness in Israel. And the land was, was divided in so many different ways and, and uh, so many different uh, leaders and alliances being made. And last year we were, I mean last year, that was a long time ago. Last week we were in Isaiah 7 and we talked about King Ahaz. You probably left going home going like, I've never heard that much about King Ahaz in my life. Anybody, you were like, I didn't even know there was an Ahaz. And, and, and yeah, I'm the same way when I, when I was looking at it and studying it and then it just, it just came to life. And I'm still so excited about last week's message that I have to be careful not, not to preach it. But, but two chapters later, we're in Isaiah 9 today and we talk about it is unto us, a child is born unto us, a son is given and his name shall be called. And we're going to get to that in just a second. But it's, it's Handel's Messiah. How many centuries have people been playing and singing Handel's Messiah not knowing the name that they were declaring? the hope that they were declaring. And, and there is so much in, in a name. There is so much in the name of, of Jesus. There is so much in the characteristics and the things that, that he was gonna come and do and what, what we got to see him fulfill. But this is the cool thing about prophecy. It didn't just speak about what was happening then and what, even what we've experienced now, but it also speaks of a coming age. And this Jesus that, that will reign, his kingdom is everlasting. It is never ending. Come on, that's your God. That's your Jesus. This, you know, this is temporal, what we're dealing with. Uh, the economic stuff is temporal. The disease stuff, I know it's serious, but it's temporal. 
The, the, the financial thing that you're facing right now, it's temporal. The, the search in the, for a job, it's temporal. The search for a husband is temporal. The search for a dog for your kids for Christmas, it's, it's the struggle. I understand it's real, but it's temporal. We have an eternal God, an eternal kingdom. And part of, part of what wants to, what, what the gift of Christmas is to have an eternal perspective on the bigness of who our God is. And that he is able now, but he, he will be able forever more. He is the God that we serve. He is the God that has an everlasting kingdom. But I, I, uh, I did some research on some names. I want to have a little, a little fun with this. Uh, out of the la- in the last 10 years, there's been, uh, I, I made up a list of interesting names. Now, if this is your name, then you have a very interesting and a unique name. And some of you are like, there's no way somebody named their son or their daughter that. But they did. There's proof because it's on Google, and that means it's truth. So, uh, uh, but but here's here's a little bit of research. I want to give you this list of names. Let's have some fun with this. So here's male names, uh, and we're just going to give you just a few of them. But some of the most interesting, uh, unique male names in the last 10 years. Here's the first one, A, B, C, D, E. Yeah, it's actually Absidy. It's literally a name. The, the parents were giving their kids a head start in kindergarten, like, like, Absidy, come on, A, B, C, D, E, there you go. It's pretty interesting, yeah. All right, here's number two, amen. Amen. Yeah, amen. Come on, amen. Just imagine you sound like a preacher when you're, when you're calling your kids. Come on, amen. Dinner time, amen. <laughs> Clean your room, amen. All right, here's, here's another one, Andrews with apostrophe s now that that was probably that was probably designed so that everybody would know that's andrew's kid like that's andrew's andrew's come on that's An- that's andrew's yeah donna and i get it we're we're tracking together all right that's adam's kid my, my, at, my, yeah i don't know i'm trying to figure out how that would work with us so all right here's a here's another one you've probably heard this one apple apple yeah Here, here's another one a uh, male name this is for real confession they were probably destined to be a priest, a confession. Like it was mom and dad said, hey, you, you're going you're gonna to follow the priestly work. Yeah. Here, here you go. This is the next one, GQ. Buddy, you're going to look good. You're GQ. And, then he, and here's the last one for, for male names. Hey. <laughs> hey. Hey, what? Hey, what? Let's. Why not? We might change Timothy's name to, hey, I just think it just saves some time. Hey, all right, good. All right, so there's male names. Here's some female names. Here you go. The first one is Alaska. Alaska. That's pretty. I like Alaska. Emma, we're changing her name to Alaska. It's very unique. Here, here's another one, chaos. <laughs> Talking about speaking it over your kids. There, here comes Chaos. Would chaos raise your name? I mean, raise your hand. You know, it's... let's pray for chaos today. Chaos is coming over. Here comes chaos. All right, here you go. Look, listen to this hashtag. I'm serious. Google it. Google tells the truth. Do hashtag. All right, here, here's. This one's, I, this one's interesting. I'm just going to leave it right here. Love child. No, you don't want that to be love. Okay. Love child. He, this one's, so I, I, the girls are a little bit more um, interesting than the guys. Here, here's another one, sin. Sin. You could do forgiveness, middle name of, An extra last name, sin. <laughs> Forgiveness of sin. All right, all right, here you go. Here's a, another interesting one, tequila. There you go. Tequila. And then the last one, a very unique name, the name Unique. Unique. I think it's kind of pretty if you didn't know what the word meant, but there's unique. There's a little bit better than, there's chaos. 
And I don't, I don't know if, if, if really we understand the power of names today like, we, like it was used in, in the, the Old Testament in the time of Isaiah, even in the time of the New Testament when, when Jesus was born. But the name declared the person. The name declared the identity of, of who, the, the, like the, the essence of the, of the person. It carries so much weight and significance. This is, and, 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 and I think for those of us, uh, we, we uh, I, I don't want to say everybody in the room, everybody has the opportunity, but, but you remember the moment in your life when you recognize just the sound of the name of Jesus brought peace brought hope jesus just just i just just right now i know this might feel a little bit funny it's kind of unorthodox but just close your eyes and i just i just want you to whisper the name jesus jesus okay you can open your eyes that person's asleep next to you wake them up we're not done yet but jesus his his name is jesus and and it's not just just any other name it's not just there there is no other name like the name of jesus and and so when when mary and joseph hear his name will be called jesus and then this is the the characteristics of this name this is the things that, that he was he's going to begin to do and this is the things that he's going to carry out all of that went went together it declared who he was the person of who he was. And then we get the, the experience of looking at it 730 years. It's prophesied before, but then we get to see in, in, a, in a small window the, the, the actual fulfillment of this Jesus and, and what he did. And so let's go all the way back. Let's look at Isaiah and check this out. Isaiah 9, we're just going to read about seven verses. And this leads up to where Isaiah says, hey, here is the king that has come. And now I just want you to remember the context of this. This is in light of King Ahaz. This is in light of a king who has not done very well, who has led really Israel and the, the, the people of God into ruin because of his leadership. And Isaiah is prophesying this in contrast to the king that they're experiencing. All right, so that's, that's where this sets up. He didn't just wake up one day and decide to go tell people about it. They know they're connecting the dots of what he is saying. Isaiah 9, starting with verse 1, it says, Nevertheless, a time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. Now, I want to give you this, this image. For those of you that have been to Israel, you, you've seen this place. Up on the top of this mountain, if you look down, there is a road that, that actually leads down to, like when you're, you're standing up high so you can see all of the, the landscape, and you have the Sea of Galilee, and then you have all the, the, the cities or the places, they were really like small towns that are around the Sea of Galilee. That's where Jesus did most of his ministry, his traveling around. So, so it wasn't like Jesus, you know, jumped on a plane or jumped on a train and he went over here and he went over here he walked and traveled to these places right in this circle well there's this moment i mean i remember it so vividly and when i read this this week i i just i'm sitting at my desk praying and preparing and it just it overwhelms me because isaiah sees into the future a time when a king will come and walk down this road into a land that is desperate, into a land of people that are suffering, that are in darkness, not just temporal darkness, not just circumstantial darkness, but eternal darkness. And then he declares, the light will come. Their light will come. So I just, uh, without Having been there without seeing it, I, I want you just to, to, to see the, the bigness and then that actual place. Like to know it in the Bible is one thing, but to actually stand there and see that's the road that Jesus walked down. And I can just imagine the smile on Jesus' face. You just imagine a grown-up Jesus walking down. And he's like, it's happening right now. And Matthew 4 Matthew, the God that wrote the gospel of Matthew, actually records that this is actually happening. So Matthew, so many, uh, so many hundreds of years later, actually says this prophecy that Isaiah is saying is actually happening. It's, it's happening right now. It says, the people that walk in darkness will see a great light. For those in the land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And his name is, help me out, his name is Jesus. 
Verse 3, you will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They'll rejoice before you as people rejoice at a harvest time like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of slavery. Listen to this promise. You will break the yoke of slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. Now, I don't, wanna, I don't want you to get lost in this, but everything is in the Bible for a reason. He's talking about Gideon and the army of Midian. There were thousands upon thousands upon thousands of enemy soldiers that Gideon led an army of 300 to defeat. What is Isaiah saying? He says, hey, big things come in small packages. That's not just a promise about Jesus. It's a promise about any Adam's family member. (laughs) But here's the hope of that. I know the situation might look big right now. But big things come in small packages. That it might look overwhelming that it might look desperate it might look and and then this is what Isaiah is saying guys it looks it looks daunting it looks overwhelming it looks like there's this it's impossible but just like God did something impossible with Midian 300 soldiers took out and it says and I love the promise of that it says the Lord went before them aren't you glad we have a Lord that will go before you the Lord goes before you you know what you know what the soldiers of Midian did they showed up You know what what, what God asks us to do? You show up and let me do what you can't do. You show up, you pray, you believe, you stand in the gap and let me do what you can't do. Wow, so he takes them back to that and here's what's cool is these people knew the story of Gideon. Like they would reference and go, oh, yeah, like that little wimp in the wine press that God turned into a warrior and God did all this, he delivered the people. Man, God's gonna do something like that and Isaiah said, yes, he is, but it's gonna be even better. He says, you'll, you'll break the rod that's on their shoulders. He says, you'll break the, uh, or the yoke. And he says, you'll break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army. The yoke of suffering endured. The rod of suffering is inflicted. So I want you to see the two difference. This is not just, this is, this is the suffering that they're experiencing, but it also speaks about the rod, the source of their suffering. Jesus came to deliver us from both. The contrast of these two express the totality. I'm not reading the scripture. I'm giving you an explanation of that scripture. Everybody's like, I'm not, that's not in my version. The contrast expresses the totality. All the suffering is now at an end in the expected work of God. So the suffering, the source of the suffering, all of that comes to an end in Jesus. It says the boots of the warrior, now I'm reading the Bible, verse 5, the boots of the warrior and the uniforms, the blood stained by war will be burned. They will be the fuel for the fire. What, what is he saying? This is the fruit of the victory of Jesus. All, all the spoils, at the end of the war, at the end of the battle, they would take all the, all the blood stained garments, all the boots, all the stuff, because you, you didn't need boots for fighting anymore. They would take everything and they would burn it. What, what is he saying? This is the finished work of Jesus. When Jesus got on the cross and he died and he declared, it is finished. This is the finished victory of the work of Jesus. All that's being burned. There will be, this will be the fruit of this victory. What now? And then he goes on to say, this king will rule. For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I want you to see this. Our shoulders were delivered from the burden because his shoulders carried it. Like, I I love the prayer that the government is on his shoulders, and we pray that about the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Or when they were praying against communism, they prayed about the government. Like they, we, you ever notice that? We take the Bible and we put it in the context that our limited context and understanding of what we, we know. And, and I, I'm, all, I'm all for praying that the authority rests on his shoulder, but, but that's not, that, that scripture is taken out of context. Government just simply represented rule and authority. And he was saying that once the, see, once the government and the authority and the rule was, was on the enemy. The enemy carried the authority and the rule. But, but what Isaiah is saying is, guys, that, that kingdom is passing and a new kingdom is coming into place where the authority and the rule will rest on this King Jesus. 
Like that's that's the weight of this. Uh, see what happens is is they they thought that they were ta- that they were looking for a king that would come in and replace King Ahaz. They thought it was just this temporal relief of of man we're suffering and and the rod and oh man you know and we're in slavery and yes those were real issues and yes those were real concerns but but Isaiah is prophesying about a new kingdom realm that would that would come into to place and and, and I want to challenge the idea that sometimes when we're facing a situation we allow the temporal to define the eternal We allow the temporal circumstance or the oppression that we're currently facing to define our God. And and instead, Isaiah is saying, guys, get your eyes off the temporal and recognize you have a king that is coming that will establish an everlasting kingdom, one that will not fade with age. A kingdom that will not fade with circumstances. A kingdom that will not fade. He's contrasting the two different kingdoms that are at work. And the two different kingdoms that we have the choice to put our trust and our confidence in. And I was thinking, man, these people just didn't get it. 730 years before Jesus comes, they didn't get it. There wasn't something that materialized right in front of them and they recognized. Like, you understand the space and the gap between the the fact that Isaiah declared it was going to happen. And then when the baby was born to Mary and Joseph. Like there was a huge gap. And I think sometimes the gap between when God said it and when we see it is when we get lost in the temporal and think for somehow God's hand is too short. See, just because you're not experiencing what he's promised doesn't mean that his promise isn't true and that his promise isn't real. Just because you didn't see it, like, like it's just because it didn't happen in a microwave and he might be wanting to cook it up in a crock pot. You see what I'm saying? And I think, I think if, we don't, if we're not careful, we rely on a microwave relationship with God of we put it in, it's in two minutes, and then ding, 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 ding. But let, let me ask you something. You ever had one of those lean cuisine, turkey dressing, all-in-one Thanksgiving lean cuisine? They make them. Comes with gravy. Comes with all the fixings. It even says... Thanksgiving, a real, like, you know, real Thanksgiving meal. But, but I want you to take that, and you, if you're in love with lean cuisine, like you might want to name your child lean cuisine, and you're in love with that, man, that's great. But, but if we're settling for lean cuisine, instead, of, and then I just want you to picture the full spread. I mean, I'm talking about the, the turkey that Michael cooked on the green egg. It's glorious. And it's not splatch cocked where it looks vulgar. I'm talking about, you know, the whole thing. He's, it's, it's, it's got all the smell. It's got all the, the fixings and all the stuff. is the mac and cheese and the layers of mac. Like, like Lean Cuisine can't touch that. And I want you to think about in our own walk with the Lord, are we satisfied? Are we settling for a faith that only goes surface instead of a faith that recognizes that no matter what temporary circumstances I'm facing, he is a king whose kingdom will never end. That yes, there is present suffering. suffering. Yes, there are things going around that I don't understand, and, and, but we, we cling to a promise that isn't... See, see I, I, I'm not... I don't need to go around searching for God. He's right here. Like, I don't, I don't need to, to look here. And then, well, where's God? Well, I just need to go here, and I, need, I just need to go here. And, then, and, and I appreciate sometimes the things that are happening that, around the globe and the, the move and the work that God's doing. But do you understand, we don't need to go find him. He lives right here. And I don't need to go see a manifestation when the manifestation is living right inside of me. And I think, I think sometimes we're looking for something when Jesus, the whole, he's going, guys, I'm right here. Don't miss that I'm right here. And we see this in the, 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 almost the position of the religious leaders. Remember, they were so in tune with the word, the word. They were so in tune with the law. They were so in tune with, with what, what they, they thought was the thing to believe in, the thing to build their lives on. 
And what was their what was their frustration with Jesus? They had a lot of them. But their frustration with Jesus was that was that he wasn't the king that they were expecting. He said things like, the kingdom is come, and my kingdom is come, and then when you see me, you see God. Like, that really threw him for a loop when he says, I'm God. Whoa, 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 you're God? Then what does that mean for us? They thought it meant that somehow their position was compromised, and it wasn't that. He was their hope just as much as he was everybody else's. But it was two wars and two systems at work. I think it's interesting that Jesus never politicized his platform. Why, why did he never, do you, do you understand in the time of, of, of these kings, in the time of the authority, in the time of all, like we think it's crazy now. Y'all, it was crazy. It was crazy in Isaiah's time. It was crazy in, in Jesus' time. It's crazy in our time. Can I get an amen? But Jesus didn't politicize his platform, they wanted him to. What about, what about this ruler? What about this? What about that? And he says, you pray for them, and you support them, and you, it is not, not this side or not that side. No, but what was he doing? He pointed people to a kingdom because he wasn't here to, to, to establish a political agenda. He was here to save our very souls. He was here to, to set up and declare his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I just, I, I want to challenge you today that, that in light of the, the end of the year and in light of the year that we've seen, I think Isaiah's words speak and challenge us to lift our perspective and to see what we're not seeing. And maybe you are seeing it today, and, 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 and now we just need to lean in and recognize that, man, we can, even, we can see it even clearer. He is the king whose kingdom will never end. And the... The words that come out of our mouth and the lives that we live will reflect the perspective that we have. And so if our perspective is temporal and our if, if our constant frustration what is, 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 is an economic or a, a, a political or a, the particular thing that's happening, the challenge that's happening in my marriage, in my home. And, and do you understand, I'm not belittling, I'm not making small of any of that. I just want to, I just want to help you make, make, I want to hush up, make, make, I want you to, make, I want you to make big the, good, the bigness of God, like recognize, like we don't make God bigger, but, but I believe he can be bigger in our lives today. I believe we can take our focus off of, of things that are small that we make a big deal. And I think sometimes our perspective of God, we hold it up to the things that we're facing or we hold it up to the challenges around us and it frustrates us and it, it overwhelms us because, because somehow we're like, man, I, I don't know if God can handle this. And I think back to 730 years, I think these, these people were listening to this and going, man, yeah, I, we're all for that. Let a king come. And then Jesus says in John 1, John tells us about Jesus in John 1 and says that he came to his people, but they didn't even recognize him. Because he didn't come riding on chariots. He didn't come riding on a, uh, a, an elephant. Which He didn't come riding. He didn't come the way they thought he was going to come. And I wonder sometimes if we miss the experience of the realness and the closeness of God because he doesn't come the way that we think he should come. Sometimes I think we're looking for the answer of our, of our prayer instead of looking to Jesus. Nothing wrong with praying, but he's the author and the finisher of our faith, not the answer to your prayer. And I wanna challenge us to, to press in and to go deeper, to really experience him. And I, I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, but I know Jesus. I don't know what's gonna happen in 2021, but I know Jesus. I'm believing for certain things, and I believe that when we walk according to his word, that, that he promises, there are promises that we can expect to receive, and, and that we can, the, uh, this isn't about, well, just whatever happens, happens. It's not that. It's, it's, the, it's, this, it's this confidence in this peace that I can rest assured that no matter what happens, he is a king on his throne forever.
And we're just barely going to touch this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish it next week. Because there's a lean cuisine waiting on us that we've got to get to. But the, but the first thing he declares is he is a wonderful counselor. He is a wonderful counselor. He knows where you are. He knows you. He knows your situation. He knows your circumstance. I want you to connect this to him being a king. He, he, he is a king. This is how he will rule. Now, we call him wonderful counselor, but, but his name isn't actually wonderful counselor. What Isaiah is doing is building the characteristics. Remember, the name carries, it actually announces and declares who a person is. And so he's, he's declaring this is how this king will rule. He is a wonderful counselor. That word counselor, it doesn't mean that God, Jesus, is your wonderful therapist. He is good at that. Anybody ever been therapized by Jesus? What is that called? We call it when uh, Jesus juked. You ever been Jesus juked by the Holy Spirit? Me and Sam have. Okay. What's the What's the other thing that we say? Um, I'm gonna have a come to Jesus meeting with you. Y'all Y'all ever had that before? You should have one. Like. Amy says, Michael, you need to go have a come to, we're, gonna have, we're about to have a come to Jesus meeting. And what is that? He's the wonderful advisor, he, but, but he's, not, he's not just, just your, your therapist, but like the way we understand counselor is so much more than that. He's not like the counselor on Star Wars. Anybody know my Star, any of my Star Wars fans out there? Counselor. He's so much more than that. He is an everlasting father. His kingdom never ends. He's a good father. His love is reckless. It comes in such a way that no shadow can, can hide him, that, that no wall can stop him. He is an everlasting father. It speaks to our relationship with him. He is the mighty God. And I love that he's not just the mighty God from the distance, but he is mighty in my behalf right now. He is mighty right here where I, where I am living. Like he knows what's happening right now in me. He knows what's happening in our city. He knows what's happening at Tanner right now. He, like, he knows that. He is in touch with that. That's why we can pray and we connect with a God who is our strength. And then he is the Prince of Peace. That word prince means administrator. He is the administrator of peace. Here's what, what that looks like. Administrator doesn't mean he does all the paperwork or answer the phone when it comes to peace. It means that he is the administrator, the distributor of peace. The actual, y'all know shalom, the greeting, the Jewish greeting, when somebody would greet each other, they would say shalom, and when they left each other, they would say shalom. I still think we should, we should do that. I mean, just like shalom, what, what is that, that peace, it's wholeness, this completeness, and what, what is Jesus doing? He is the distributor of your wholeness. So with the name of Jesus, he is the Prince of Peace. He is the distributor. What, what does he do? He goes, hey, peace. Not peace. But peace. And he's not a peace that greets you and then leaves you. He is a peace that takes up residence in your life. We can know him. He is the administrator of my peace. He is the administrator of your peace. I want to put up this last verse because I, I think we can experience this in such a real way, not just an ancient promise and an ancient scripture. You can put up that last verse in my notes, John 4, 13. It says, by this way we know with confident assurance that we abide in him and he in us. I want you to see this. This isn't just a story written about a historical figure that, that would one day happen and would one day c come true and that we would, we would need to have faith in a story or confidence in a story. No, this is the reality of who Jesus, that he would abide in us and we would abide in him. That, that word abide means to remain, to dwell. That means that wherever you go, he goes. That wherever he goes, you go. That you are abiding, that you're meshed together. Uh, in this relationship because he has, how? How does that happen? Not just because we know it in our minds, but it says because he has given us, help me out, his Holy Spirit. 
He has given us his spirit. Now listen, these people in Isaiah, they didn't know this. They didn't, they didn't have this experientially, like to know the reality and the closeness of the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace, the mighty God, the everlasting father. They, they didn't. It was, it was at a it was at a, such a distance from them. They, they didn't connect it. They, they, and, and we know that because they missed it, but we also know it because Jesus came so that we carry the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace everywhere we go. We know this because he says, I promise them I, I will give them my spirit. So, so right there, I just want you to tap yourself, not too hard now, but I just want you to tap yourself right there on the, on the chest. Come on, you're not doing it. You got to, you got, there you go. Okay. Right there, he lives right here inside. But, but, you go, but, but Michael, what about this that I'm dealing with? The wonderful counselor lives right inside. But what, what about I don't have the strength? The mighty God lives right, right here inside of you. But, but, I, but I don't, I, right now, I'm not experiencing peace. The prince of peace, the administrator of your peace is right here. And there is no end. His arm is not too short. There is no end to his kingdom. And so I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know where the message lands and this word lands for you. But today we have the responsibility to be recipients of this promise, but to be carriers of this promise. Carriers. Like you, you take wisdom Wherever you go, you take the might and the strength. Everywhere you go, you take peace. Everywhere you, these, these are all these characteristics of Jesus, but, but, but this isn't just something he did and, and said, hey, this is going to be nice. Or this is going to be something that you can read about, or this is going to be something that you can look to. No, this is something that you can experience. Jesus made it possible. Because of Christmas, we can experience the closeness of of who he is, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes right now? And let's just take a moment and I just want you to pray and just make room for the Holy Spirit to just come and believe and trust that he's ministered to you through his word, but but just to come right now and a demonstration of his word that you would, whatever those whatever experience that is required, whatever you're facing right now. Perhaps today you're, you've been looking at the temporary and haven't seen the eternal and seen the bigness of what this announcement meant. His kingdom is everlasting. That your God is big in the temporal, that your God is big in the eternal. So, Lord, right now, all over this room and people that are watching online, Lord, we just come together as your people. We submit ourselves before you. We submit ourselves to the name of Jesus. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God, our everlasting father. Our prince of peace. We need you. We recognize our need for you. We recognize that there's probably some areas that we've settled for the temporal. We're looking for an answer that's right away. And Lord, you were here to establish a kingdom that is eternal, to give us a kingdom perspective. And Lord, we just ask you, Holy Spirit, you live inside of us. Would you show us what that means? Would you lead us into that truth? As our year ends, as we head into a new year, God, we want faith that goes deeper, not just something that's temporal. It's not just something that's, that's just on the surface, but God of faith that, that can't be shaken by circumstances. A faith that's not shaken by the uncertainty around us, but a faith that is sure in a God who has established a kingdom that will never end. Thank you for that truth. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our hearts right now. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And he is all of this 
Everything that we just described, everything that we sang about today, it is so true. He really is who he says he is. And he did this so that he could have a relationship with you, so that you could know him and experience a walk with him, so that you could have this kind of faith that we've described today. And if you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, the Bible says that we must believe in him to experience that. There's a real heaven and a real hell, and you are not designed to be separated from God in hell. You were designed, you were created to be in one relationship with him. But all of us, because of sin, because of death, and it came in and it divided us, it separated us from God. But Jesus made a way where we can be in relationship with him. And so maybe today you need to put your faith and your trust in Jesus for the first time. Maybe you have prayed this, this similar prayer before and, and you've been walking with God before, but you know today you're not walking closely with him and today you need to rededicate your life to him. I wanna pray over both of those things. If you're in the room, I'm just gonna ask you really quickly, I'm not gonna embarrass you or call you out or make you say anything or come up here, but, but if you're here today, would you just lift up your hand and say, Michael, that's me, pray for me today, I need Jesus. I wanna put my trust and my confidence in him. Today I'm coming back home to Jesus. Today I need to restart my relationship with him. I need a fresh start with him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you're watching online and you can, there's a place in the comment bar. You can just say, hey, that's me. Today I'm praying that prayer. I'm gonna give you some words to say right now. This is between you and God. It's very personal. You can say your own words or you can use these words as we commit our lives to Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus. Jesus, I believe you really are who you say you are. I, I believe there is salvation only found in you. And so today I come and, and I submit to King Jesus. I submit to your authority, to your Lordship. I believe that you came and you died on the cross, that you beat death and you beat sin. On the third day, you rose again. It really did happen. And now you are alive and well and seated in heaven. Today I put my trust in you. Today I come to you for the first time, or, or today I come to you, I, I return back to a personal relationship with you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for being my mighty God, my everlasting Father, my Prince of Peace, my wonderful Counselor. Today I declare your Lordship. Thank you for being my Savior. Thank you for being my friend. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.